Closing the week out strong with yet another edition of The Block. I've got my guys, Carl Reed, Blake Bruckemeyer here, ready to talk some college ball. It's been a fun week so far. Let's finish strong. But before we do that, you at home, like, share, subscribe, continue to get us out there. The Block is growing at a rapid pace. Let's keep it rolling as we keep building up towards the 2022 college football season. Speaking of the 2022 college football season, P.J. Fleck is eventually going to lead his Minnesota Golden Gophers onto the field, but a little bit of drama surrounding this individual's name. And like I mentioned yesterday, we love a little coaching drama, right? Val Martin, former Minnesota football player, recently went on a little bit of a Twitter tirade, if you will, and among his comments called P.J. Fleck a used car salesman, again, among a few other interesting comments. Now, Carl, I want to go to you first on this because – this feels like yet another edition of Carl Reed telling us, hey, this happens more often than you think, but what's your reaction to all of this? We're in an environment now in college football where kids have the opportunity through social media to say what is on their mind. And I think that this is a critical point for college coaches because there are a lot of promises made in recruiting. There are a lot of promises made on how a relationship is supposed to be. And so when a player feels like those promises aren't kept and that those relationships needs aren't met, you have people that are gonna lash out. I've been in some of those rooms where some of those promises were made to kids and their families by college coaches and then the relationship turns bad. So when a kid doesn't feel like he has any other outlet or that he doesn't have any other way to get a response, they're gonna immediately go to social media. I don't know the exact specifics of the situation, but I do know that when you're recruiting a kid, you have a responsibility to be honest with them at all times and about all potential situations. Yeah, I think there's two sides to every story. I think uh, PJ Fleck obviously has uh, a reputation uh, as a coach that's a little bit different. And I think this kid, obviously did some things that P.J. Fleck didn't like. I mean, one of the things that I read and uh, listened to his podcast that he did last week was, you know, P.J. Fleck and his position coach uh, told him to go in a game and get on the field and go play. And he said that he wasn't going to go in the game. So, you know, that's a cardinal sin for a football player to, uh, to not answer the bell when called on. So I, I think there's two sides to everything. Every single kid that's getting recruited out of the portal isn't going to be an instant impact player and an All-American and a starter. So, uh, you know, he was probably recruited there as a depth piece, whether that was a, uh, something that the coaches told him to, from the beginning or not. Who knows? I doubt it. I mean, I wouldn't tell a kid that. But, uh, but I think there's two sides to every story. I think P.J. Fleck is right on kicking the kid off the team for not going in the game when he was, when he was asked to. And I'm sure P.J. Fleck has done a lot of things uh, there that, uh, that that kids don't like. But you know what? The the coach is in charge. They're in charge of your playing time. And if you don't like what's going on there, then that's just the way it is now. But uh, especially if you don't have any, any eligibility left. Blake, the one thing I disagree with you on here is that I don't believe that there's two sides to every story. I always just believe it's one side. It's the truth of what actually happened. And I think that the college coach always has some responsibility to do his diligent, do, do his due diligence and recruit guys who can fit into his culture. And there's a difference between culture and a cult. And so a lot of guys have developed culture, but row the boat is more of a cult. And so you have to really do your due diligence because that situation isn't for everybody, but you, you have to let the kids know exactly how things are going to be. And I know that kids often get in situations where things happen that they didn't know was going to happen. And when you are getting to the point where a kid doesn't go in a the game, there's a lot of things that happen before that for it to lead to that moment. And I think that some of those things, you know, um, had to happen leading up to that moment. When a kid gets to the point that he says he's not going into a football game, that's not the first time that we've had some type of disagreement or situation. It had to be some other things leading up into that. And so I think that a coach has just as much of a responsibility to try to bring the player along as the player has 
to have a relationship with the coach. These coaches are recruiting these kids. They know exactly who they are. They know exactly what all the issues are. They know exactly what their mentality is. And they know the things that they promised the kid and his family. And a lot of kids are in situations where they don't have any advocates or anybody to speak on their behalf. And it's always troubling to me when I see situations like this because I've been in a room with so many college coaches who've been dishonest with kids and their families. And then we have to deal with the fallout of um, hurt feelings and situations. Yeah, well, there's, there's no doubt that there was a lot of drama going on over the course of the season and, and that, you know, this kid was not happy with, with what was going on. But still, if you're asked to go in a game and, and you're suited out for the game and you say, I'm not going in, that's a that to me that that's that's the end of the line for for that kid because uh, regardless of all the other things that that go on, uh, he's got to go play if the coach want, wants him in the game. So uh, I'm sure I'm sure there'll be a lot more drama coming out of this. But there's a, there, there's a, this is going to be very common across the country because with the transfer portal, kids are going to leave with, with a lot of with a lot of expectations and. All those expectations aren't going to meet what these kids are expecting because uh, every situation is not going to turn out where the grass is always greener on the other side. I just think that if you tell the kids the truth on the front end, you don't have to deal with many issues on the back end. I think we would all agree. Hopefully time heals all, but hey, time helps all sometimes, right? I know I may be grasping at straws, but Paris Johnson might be the beneficiary of time. Blake, you recently have done another film study. We love these here on the block. This guy obviously played a lot of guard for Ohio State, now moving to tackle a more natural position. I'm curious, though, what you saw from him last year on film. Yeah, Paris Johnson is a, is a great prospect for Ohio State. He played right guard last year uh, at Ohio State. Uh, the, the five games that I watched, I thought he was a, uh, an excellent player. Uh, I thought Nebraska gave him a little, a little bit more problems than anybody else did, uh, but he still had a great game against them. He's got excellent size, feet. He's got excellent hand placement. He's a great pass protector. He really understands how to get to a spot, how to put his hands and feet in the right position, rarely gets knocked back. Uh, he's, uh, he rarely, if ever, made the same mistake twice in a game, which is something I like to see as a, as a former O lineman, a lot of a lot of times you don't really know you're making the same mistake, and it's hard to take it off film during the game. But he do, he does a great job uh, of doing that. So I think that those are some positives for him. I think moving to left tackle this season is going to actually help him and benefit him because that's more of a natural spot to him. He's got a few little technique flaws that he can fix up, and uh, I'd like to see him take his game to the next level with a little more aggression, being meaner, being a nasty guy. Uh, he's a, he's an excellent athlete, gets in the right position, but I want to see him as a finisher uh, in 2022 for Ohio State. Paris was a rotational starter last year at guard for Ohio State, makes the move to left tackle. When Ryan Day moves you from guard to left tackle to protect C.J. Stroud's blind side, He's showing that he has a lot of faith in the type of player that you are. This is a kid that has all of the tools and projects as a guy who could potentially be a first round pick down the road, but he does have to go on the field this year and prove it. Blake made the statement he'd like to see him get meaner, a little tougher in certain situations. If he does that, he'll be able to name his price because left tackles get paid a lot of money and he's playing for Ohio State. He's going to have every opportunity to show that he's one of the premier guys in the country. Mm, I'm ready to show the young guy in me, but I still remember Paris Johnson going viral on social media for a couple of clips of him being nasty. So if he can bring that to the collegiate level at left tackle, I'm with you guys. I think he's about to get a pretty nice payday come the NFL draft. I want to now go to South Florida. UCF recently landed a pair of four-star twins on Wednesday. Their recruiting class continues to climb. It was number 37 nationally in 2022. This is the night's final season in the American Conference, and they will soon join the Big 12 officially as of July in 2023. Gus Malzahn is leading the program. They've got some interesting pieces, obviously a very nice recruiting hotbed. Carl, should we take the Knights as a serious conference threat 
upon their entrance into the Big 12? I think so. First of all, you have a coach who's already proven that he can win at the highest level. Offensive coordinator for Auburn with Cam Newton. They win the national championship, beat Alabama. Head coach at Auburn, they lose in the national championship game led by Nick Marshall, but along the way, they beat Alabama. He was the only guy in the SEC who gave Nick Saban problems on a consistent basis. I wonder if the people in War Eagle country wish that Gus Malzahn was still there with what's been going on with their program. You put him at a place like Central Florida that is a recruiting hotbed, lots of talent. He probably doesn't initially get the big time guy out of Florida because of some of those other schools, but it is going to be a great destination for guys who come back or transfer portal guys. He's been an elite offensive mind. The Big 12 has always been an offensive heavy conference. I think that you have to count Central Florida as a real player in the Big 12. Yeah, I think they're going to be a player as well. I don't think they're going to be uh, as dominant as, as maybe uh, some people think that they would be. Recruiting in Texas, having the ability to come into the state of Texas and play football games now is going to be a huge benefit for them. But at the end of the day, I still think that they're going to be a big transfer team. They're going to, got, they're going to have some of their better players transfer out, and they're going to have some, some players from other schools that maybe didn't like where they're at or from Florida and want to come home that are going to come back to, to UCF to play. So I think uh, that'll be a struggle for them, as every team will be, especially uh, at a little bit of a, a, a smaller conference than, than the SEC or the Big Ten. Guys are going to got, got, want to leave and go to a bigger program. So, But I, but I see them as, as a player. I think that they're going to have uh, and, and excellent people, excellent athleticism on their defense. And uh, if they can recruit Texas and Florida at a high level and bring in some key transfers, uh, then, you know, the sky's the limit for Gus Malzahn and, and UCF in the Big 12. Quick follow-up here, Blake. If you are UCF or even Cincinnati, BYU, Houston, some of these newcomers into the Big 12, and you're hearing these rumors about those potential Pac-12 schools coming into the new Big 12, how much are you sweating bullets as you try to be the contender that we all perceive? Well, I mean, you're going to have competition no matter where you go. I mean, Cincinnati's got competition in the AAC right now. I mean, they've got multiple games a year where that they that they've got you know close games and tough games. You always have you know the 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 dreaded Navy nightmare that you have to play in the AAC, stopping the triple option. So I think there's there's competition everywhere. Obviously. Uh, you would expect the, the Big 12 uh, slash possibly Pac-12 merger uh, to, to, to bring in even, even more talent and better, better players. But kids want to play against the best. They want to go against the top competition. They want to be on a primetime stage. They want to be in the spotlight. So uh, the more that you can do for these kids, the better. And I think competition uh, you know, brings out the best in people and competition breeds success. Hmm. The more competition you bring into a situation is going to is going to separate the real programs from the fake ones, the contenders from the pretenders. It's going to let you know who's the real deal and who's fool's gold. All right. So I think that that's a, a big thing when you add those teams. And I think it's a great thing for college football. I definitely see where you guys are coming from. But I know personally, if I were in the offices of a UCF or a Cincinnati or a Houston probably a little bit nervous if Utah suddenly comes knocking on my door or even Washington and Oregon. I'm interested to see how this all plays out. All right, we're going to close the show with this, gentlemen. Surprise topic. This is the final show for our fearless leader and excellent producer, Aaron Grisham. And Aaron, who you can follow at home at Aaron Grisham 247 on Twitter. It's Grish Ham. He's a big fan of Carl Reed one liner. So Carl, I'd be remiss if we didn't send off our guy without giving you an opportunity to give him some potential life advice from coach Reed live as we send him away into the sunset. Well, what I, what I would say to Aaron, Aaron is, is a guy that lives in Memphis and he's a huge fan of all Memphis sports. And what mm -hmm. I would tell him this year, if he's expecting anybody in Memphis to win championships and if he's investing his emotions in that, I would suggest that my friends stay away from sharp objects. <laughs> <laughs> and that's a good way to close the show. Always fun here on The Block. You at home, like, share, subscribe. We'll see you again next week. But gentlemen, to you two, it's always fun.